Hey everybody, thanks for clicking on this video. Before we start, I think it's important to mention that this is the first of five Ratchet & Clank re-reviews. My video on Ratchet & Clank 2 will drop next week, but if you want to see that video now, you can become one of my patrons on Patreon who had seen this video well before it dropped on YouTube. My Patreon offers an exclusive Discord server and early video access. And if I reach $200 a month on Patreon, I'll also include a Secret Agent Clank re-review. So consider donating if you can. Now with that said, let's get on with the show. As established just now, this is not my first time talking about the Ratchet & Clank series. When I first started doing YouTube in 2015, my intention was to review the Slide Trilogy, the Jack series, and the first five Ratchet & Clank games. The nature of doing this job is that you expand your skills a lot with each video, especially early on. I'm not particularly ashamed of my oldest work, it's pretty charming to look back on, but I definitely think these games deserve higher quality videos from me. I'll get to the Jack and Daxter series again sometime in the future as well. The release of Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart was the perfect time to go back and talk about this series once more. In fact, I just did a video talking about Rift Apart and the Ratchet series in general where I got to speak about my old videos in more detail, so check that out if you're interested. I guess the only place to start will be by going back to the beginning. Ratchet and Clank as a series is turning 19 years old this year. Like, where does the time go? For comparison, a 19-year-old game when Ratchet and Clank came out on the PlayStation 2 in 2002 was Mario Bros. Arcade. Not Super Mario Bros. Mario Bros. I don't know, I just find it crazy to stop and think that early 2000s media is really not contemporary anymore. Something experienced in my lifetime can be considered old. Anyway, Ratchet & Clank was developed by Insomniac Games, who followed the same path that Naughty Dog did when going from PS1 to PS2. Both companies made names for themselves on the first PlayStation with Naughty Dog's Crash Bandicoot and Insomniac's Spyro the Dragon. Despite the advantages they had, both of these brands were held back because Universal owned the rights to the IP for both franchises and published the games, serving as an unneeded middleman when bringing the game to Sony's PlayStation. Starting with the PS2, these companies cut that middleman and worked directly with Sony for the new franchises, Naughty Dog's Jack and Daxter and Insomniac's Ratchet and Clank. I bring this up because I actually talked about Crash and Spyro last year in a series of Versus videos comparing the two franchises. I finished that series, but to be honest, it wasn't really working. Crash just inherently appealed to me more than Spyro, which comes with the territory of the two being completely opposed in platformer design. The reason I did it was because I thought doing a series comparing Naughty Dog and Insomniac would be interesting. The plan was to keep that going with a Jack and Ratchet series, which I also thought would be an interesting way to revisit games I've done videos on before. However, the experiment didn't really resonate with my audience, and I didn't really think it was that fun to work on by the end, so when talking about Jack and Ratchet again, we're doing it the only way I know how, which is one video focused on each game. Speaking of focusing on games, Ratchet & Clank 1 from 2002. Whenever I play this game again, one of the things that always remains jaw-dropping even almost 20 years later will be the next generation appeal it had. The Spyro trilogy on PS1 had vaster landscapes than other PS1 platformers, but jumping from Spyro 3 to Ratchet & Clank and you can see just how much the PS2 hardware allowed Insomniac to up their game when it came to the presentation. In case you didn't know, Ratchet & Clank sees you traveling from planet to planet in the Solana galaxy, and each new planet begins with a massive shot showcasing the scale that could pull off on PlayStation 2. For example, when you run down the ramp of Metropolis and see the massive skyscrapers and flying cars going by at high speed. Also, just look at how much stuff is happening on the screen when landing on Novalis or Kalibo 3. Pound for pound, I think Ratchet & Clank from a visual standpoint isn't quite as good as Jack & Daxter, but the game is still chock full of visual appeal and its many distinct planets with different skylines, showcasing different biomes, and having distinct enemies that suit the location. It's all great stuff. What I'm trying to say is that Ratchet & Clank is dated nowadays, sure. However, back in 2002, I can only imagine just how out of this world it was to see all these landscapes and how big they were in comparison to what was possible only two years prior on PlayStation 1. When I say Ratchet is dated, I just mean from a technical standpoint. The art of this game is fantastic, although it is weird how the textures change shape as you approach them. But back to the technical aspects. The game runs at a 480i resolution like a vast majority of the PlayStation 2 library. However, it didn't really bother me in this game because here I didn't notice issues that other 480i games suffer from like blurring effects or comb teeth. Not saying it isn't there, it's just something I didn't notice when coming back to this game. Of course, I'm speaking on the PlayStation 2 version and not the HD collection release from 2012. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. When it comes to 7th gen games, I think the remasters are oftentimes the best versions with it being the same game with a higher resolution and frame rate. Maybe some gameplay improvements in there as well. But when it came to doing 6th gen remasters for 7th gen consoles, most of them were just disasters. Between Sly, Jack, and Ratchet, RNC was the first time I saw a lot of fans just taking issue with how the HD collection turned out. I don't think any of these beat the original versions, but of the bunch, Ratchet was the worst by far. I went back to the HD collection for about an hour when making this video, and it is awful. 
The first Ratchet & Clank is a 4x3 aspect ratio game, and the HD version renders it in 720p and 16x9, which is nice, I suppose. For when the cost of that is text upscales that look like this, HUD elements that are supposed to go off screen just hanging out in the corner like this, and whatever they did to poor Al here, then I'll just happily stick with the PS2 version. Insomniac didn't make a character that looked like that. Bad HD collections can mess with the original vision, and that's something I hate. Now, I've never made a video game remaster in my life, obviously, but I'm just saying that I would rather play the PS2 version than the new version because of the fact that it more accurately represents the experience that you were supposed to have with the game. I'm sure it's challenging to make a 6 gen remaster, but still. Earlier, I was talking about next generation appeal, and that's not just limited to the graphics. These two new faces on the mascot platformer scene weren't messing around. They were here with a massive arsenal of weapons to blow shit up with. That is actually what all the commercials are based around, humans using the explosive roster of Ratchet and Clank weapons. Okay, Pete here is going to try to hit uh, that target with the Devastator, a rocket launcher designed for Ratchet and Clank. Oh, man! Oh. The Devastator, one of 36 weapons and gadgets not fit for this world. When you open the game, the manual isn't a traditional booklet. It's actually a massive pamphlet with typical manual fare like controls, options, and weapon overviews on one side, but a giant poster of Ratchet and Clank on a grind well on the other. I'd hang it up, but then my game wouldn't have a manual in it, and this will not stand. The manual includes the basic backstory. Ratchet is a mechanic living on the planet Veldon, or Veldon, a misspelling in the same paragraph as it spelled right earlier. But as I was saying, Ratchet wishes to leave Veldon, but his ship needs a robotic ignition system to start. Meanwhile, on planet Kortu, an army of warbots is being assembled, but a computer glitch causes a tiny and empathetic robot to come off the assembly line, who escapes the factory and is chased to the planet Veldon where he meets Ratchet, who gives the bot the name Clank. The assembly line that Clank came from is owned by Chairman Drek, the main villain of the game. Drek and his people, the Blark, come from a planet called Orkson that has been polluted to a degree where nobody can live there. So Drek is building a new planet by taking pieces from other planets and then destroying them afterwards. Ratchet and Clank team up to find the galaxy's greatest hero, Captain Quark, who can stop Drek. Hopping from planet to planet, talking to inhabitants, and getting leads on what planet to go to next as they fight through an army of bad guys with all kinds of out-of-this-galaxy weaponry from the Gadgetron Corporation. Like I said, the manual gives us a closer look at these weapons, like the Bomb Glove, or the Blaster, or the Pyrocitor. I really like the look of your loadout in this game. The look of science fiction tends to lean towards really clean and refined weaponry, especially for a series like Ratchet & Clank, which is supposed to take place hundreds of years in the future. But in this game, all the weapons look deadly, but also look designed to be functional rather than stylish. Something like the Blaster is just pieces of metal bolted together. The Pyrocitor is like that as well, but it gets its fuel directly from a bucket of gasoline strapped to the barrel. The ship that Ratchet builds is this really clunky one that is, again, metal bolted together. But that's not to say that sleek ship and weapon designs don't exist, they just don't exist for consumers. People like Chairman Drek can afford that kind of thing. But I get ahead of myself. All this talk of weapons that blow your enemies away makes you wonder, how does it feel to use the weapons? This is one of Ratchet and Clank's best aspects as a game. Many of them function as the name would imply, like the Bomb Glove, where Ratchet tosses a bomb, or the Blaster, which sees Ratchet firing fast projectiles at his enemies. I already mentioned the Pyrocitor, a close-range flamethrower, and the Devastator, which is a homing missile launcher. These are some of the most basic ones, but they cover most of your combat needs, like crowd control, fast projectiles, lock-on missiles, and so on. Without weapons, Ratchet can use his wrench on enemies, which I'd only recommend when dealing with one-hit enemies, since the attack is a bit slow. But some enemies are best dealt with using it, like the Bomb Guys on Gaspar. While those weapons work great, on this run I got a lot of use of the other weapons too, starting with the one you got for free on Eudora, the Suck Cannon, which picks up small enemies and then allows you to shoot them back out of other enemies. This was consistently useful for the entire game, as it allows you to clear rooms with big and small enemies by sucking up the tiny ones first. Even something I did during the final boss fight. I do think it's inconsistent in regards to what can be sucked and what can't, but that's not the end of the world. A bigger problem I have with this weapon is that you can't control the sucking slash shooting functions. You will hold down the circle button to suck, but the second you let go you have to release the load, even if it wasn't at maximum capacity. But regardless, super useful weapon. A great weapon with no flaws would be the Glove of Doom. Just toss two orbs and it will release an army of tiny robots to hunt and destroy nearby enemies with no mercy, and I'm talking about everything from tiny enemies to whole tanks. The drone device puts a shield around Ratchet where you can get through attacks you wouldn't be able to otherwise, proving its value quickly. 
The Visibomb gun came in handy many times as you can pick off whole rooms of enemies just by standing behind cover and targeting this missile towards them. In the late game stages like Kalibo 3, Altanis, or Veldon, I use this weapon frequently because it tore things apart in one hit. By now, I hope you see that with Ratchet and Clank, there isn't a weapon I could say isn't useful in any capacity. A weapon like the Walloper is a great example. It's not super useful in most situations, but say you're dealing with enemies up close and you don't have ammo for your other weapons, the Walloper allows Ratchet to punch his enemies and kill them faster than the Wrench would have. This roster of weapons is fantastic, functional, and varied. They did an excellent job with this aspect of the game, further selling it with punchy sound design. Every weapon and gadget has an equip sound, and just listen to the blasters. How can anyone hear that and not just think of the destruction you can unleash upon the enemies? Another plus in this game's favor is how the weapons you get stay useful for the entire game. It's not like you find enemies in the late game that make the bomb glove useless. It works well even at the end of the game. Ratchet & Clank isn't just a game where you land on planets and obliterate your enemies, though. This is very much a platformer with shooting elements. Most levels come with an interesting set piece or platforming segment like the training course on Kerwan or reaching the top of the mountain on Hoven or Eudora, escaping the sewers on Realgar before you drown, escorting the resort owner to the plaza on Poketaru, or on Umbris where you need to use the Hydro Displacer to lower the water level and take out the sharks so they can't kill you when you swim through the area. This might just be the only game with the fish kills you for going out of bounds trope that allows you to enact revenge upon them in a stage. The game also has a bunch of gadgets you can use as well, like the swing shot that allows you to grapple from point to point, or the trespasser that you have to use to crack locked doors, or the aforementioned hydro displacer that can control the amount of water in a room. Ratchet & Clank is also served by just how much content there is on the disc from an exploration point of view. Each planet has multiple pathways and objectives to complete. Right at the start, you can explore Novalis by going forward into the city, which leads to the executive chairman who gives you a ship and the coordinates to Kerwan. You also need to explore the waterworks and find the plumber who gives you the coordinates to Iridia. Novalis also has a secret cave system that doesn't unlock anything you need to progress, but does provide you with extra money and gold bolts. But you won't know what is optional and what's mandatory until you've explored everywhere. For a linear game, this one's pretty open-ended. I just talked about how the first full level, Novalis, gives you access to two new worlds, Kerwan and Iridia. If you want to avoid backtracking, you'll need to get to Kerwan and pick up the swing shot that's required for a path in Iridia. The game never lets up when it comes to stuff like this. Novalis itself has a secret underwater pathway that you can only access much later in the game by getting the Hydro Pack on Hoven, or on Planet Battalia, which doesn't allow you to access the city since you need to find the Magna Boots first. The Magna Boots are on the planet Orkson, which as mentioned earlier, is Drek's home planet that's so polluted that nobody can breathe the air, meaning that Plank has to explore the area alone. Later, Ratchet gets the O2 mask from Poketaru, which he uses to explore Orkson's depths. As I was saying though, you can go back to Battalia with the Magna Boots you got, but all you get out of it is the metal detector. This game is just an interesting experience as you have to use what you find on different planets to access content you couldn't otherwise in other planets. It's really rewarding. What helps in the feeling of traveling around the galaxy is the fantastic soundtrack. David Burgo crafts a unique feeling for each planet by mixing different samples together to create this simultaneously futuristic and retro-sounding science fiction that fits all kinds of environments, like beach resorts, cold space stations, bustling cities, and everything in between. So after about two hours of playing, you'll be pretty used to how the game handles, the interaction Ratchet and Clank have, and the overall tone of the story. Planet Rilgar is where the duo finally meets Captain Quark, who claims he needs Ratchet and Clank's help in order to stop Chairman Drek's awful plot. But first, they need to meet him at his headquarters on the planet Umbris, where Ratchet and Clank have to make it through a death trap only to find out that Captain Quark actually works for Drek. And that's because he's being paid to be Drek's public representative, and part of the job is now killing Ratchet and Clank so they can't stop Drek's plan. This is when the story changes completely. Up to this point, we've seen that Ratchet can crack some jokes, but seemed on the level. After he survives the Blargain Snaggle Beast trap that Quark set up, his sights are set on getting revenge for the entire second act of the story. But Clank wants to forget Quark and stop Drek, this being the largest source of conflict for the duo. That, and Ratchet really resents Clank for having gotten him in this mess to begin with. But he still needs Clank for the robotic ignition system on their ship. When I say he resents Clank, I really mean it. Get off of me, you idiot! Just shut up and start the ship. He needs our help. Yeah? Why don't you go help him? Into another trap. Well, go on. 
Go fight some evil. At least I'm not a coward. <sighs> Whatever. As soon as I find Quark, I'm selling you for scrap. We are on a mission to save the galaxy. Speak for yourself and put your hands down. You look ridiculous. I think this is an interesting conversation because here, Insomniac was trying something pretty ambitious for their platformer. They wanted to give Ratchet a character arc, something that Crash and Spyro never did on PS1, and something Naughty Dog didn't do for Jack and Daxter in the first game, which came out a year before this. However, I think they overdid it a little. The idea is obviously that Ratchet will eventually come around as he and Clank will save the galaxy. It works, it's just that Ratchet goes from being normal to throwing as many jabs at Clank as he possibly can after Umbris. In moments like this, where there's a little more back and forth, it is working and creating a compelling arc. Perhaps the extra oxygen will help your brain to function properly. Yeah, and maybe the salt water will rust your mouth shut. As our heroes need to overcome their differences to save the day. But when Ratchet's just insulting the little guy, it just makes him kind of annoying more than anything else. You are friendly, aren't you? To you, yes. To him, no. And then we get back to Ratchet being nice and caring after Quark gets beaten. The seeds of Ratchet changing are there, like when he says this. Look, I'm still gunning for Quark. If we end up taking out Drek too, hey, fine. What? You do care. Don't push it, pal. Or when he sees the destruction of Altanis. Look, maybe you were right. This is a lot bigger than you or me. I was really selfish focusing on Quark. It is not too late to stop Drek. Hey, yeah! We've got this new ship! Let's go get him! Now you are talking. I'm not saying Ratchet's change is unnatural. In fact, when he does come around, it's satisfying storytelling. Hang on! There's an old defense turret over there. Hey, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I sincerely doubt it. You know, this time I am thinking what you're thinking. It's just that the scenes where he acts like a jerk for two hours of this six hour or so game just leaves a bad taste in your mouth when playing as that character. I'm picking my words carefully here, because like I said, I think this works really well on paper, it's just that I think they overdid the Ratchet vs. Clank angle in the second act. The existence of the Ratchet and Clank reboot from 2016 makes it so that we have to kind of choose between having an arc at all and not having one. I'd obviously prefer this, I just think there's room for improvement on how the characters are characterized. It's around the time you get to Captain Quark's HQ when the game in general gets a lot more difficult. Tighter platforming, more complex puzzles, and stronger enemies. Which is where a lot of issues with Ratchet 1 as a gameplay experience come from. Controlling Ratchet is simple enough, you know, X jumps, press it again to double jump, triangle accesses the quick select ring, square uses the wrench, and circle fires whatever weapon you have equipped. It's just that Ratchet feels kind of sluggish to control. His turns are wide and he carries a lot of momentum before coming to a stop when you let go of the analog stick. His double jump also cancels the momentum you had going forward from the first jump, which makes Ratchet a little awkward to play as. This much is easy enough to deal with, but when the enemies are starting to get tougher, I have a lot more issues with the dodge mechanics. When pressing R1 or R2, you'll crouch and you can toss your wrench at a standstill, but this leaves you open for damage. By moving the analog stick and pressing the jump button when crouched, Ratchet will dodge backwards or left and right. Another mechanic that is functional, but I don't think the dodge mechanics are sufficient when dealing with the camera. The camera turns slowly, and so when I'm trying to dodge an enemy swarm while shooting, you'll have to have this claw grip on the controller because you need to be pressing R1, moving the left and right analog sticks, and pressing circle in order to dodge, move the camera, and shoot at the same time, which is Ratchet's fundamental flaw in the first game. The game tries to address this, as when you unlock the thruster pack on Poketaru, you can use it to strafe around enemies, something the game will only tell you about once you reach the planet Hoven. However, before then, you're just left without that mechanic, even on New Game Plus. The problem with strafing is that you need to be at a standstill to activate it. Something that is awkward in the middle of a gunfight. You can't jump while strafing and you need to land before going back to regular gameplay. All frames that leave you open for damage. I did find use for the strafe a couple times like on the Altanis moon base, but it's just not a great mechanic. They clearly saw that the dodge mechanics didn't work with the camera system and tried to fix it, but didn't have the time while developing Ratchet 1. Little annoyances make Ratchet 1 more difficult than I'm guessing it was intended to be. For example, you need to press L1 to go into the first person view, this being the only way to consistently aim upward with most of your weapons. But with targets on the move, it's frustrating to work with because they can dodge your shots and attack you while you're trying to line up your hits in a view mode that doesn't let you move. This is also a game where switching weapons occurs in real time. I get that this might be done to up the stakes of combat, but it serves as a hindrance more often than not. If weapon switching is to be in real time, I think the act itself should be quick like in Jack 2. But here I either pause the game and go to the weapon list and select one, or risk damage. 
Another thing that holds Ratchet 1 back is that while the weapon roster is strong, these are also things you need to buy. Since you can't aim upwards on the move in this game, I think this part of Kalibo 3 almost feels like it requires the Visibomb gun to tear through enemies from a distance. However, the game designing segments around things like the Visibomb gun or the Devastator just feels kind of cheap because there's no guarantee you'll have that weapon because you need to spend in-game currency on that. Look at the Mega Man series, for example. All of the main stages have to be designed around Mega Man or whatever the playable character's default loadout is. So when you get to the final levels of Mega Man X4, it's totally fair for the game to design segments around moves you unlocked like the Lightning Web or Zero's Double Jump because the game knows you cleared the 8 stages to unlock those weapons to get to this point. Mega Man 7 and 8's level design gained a lot by splitting the stages in sets of 4 for this reason. In general, Bolts, the main currency of the series, has always been something I've disliked about Ratchet 1. You find bolts all around the areas and by killing enemies, and you need to spend those bolts on weapons and basic progression. I just feel like you're discouraged from spending a big chunk of bolts on a new weapon when you know you're going to have to spend several thousand bolts on an info bot or the thruster pack in order to progress. This wouldn't be as much of an issue if you had an easy way to get bolts in this game, but you don't. If you ever came across a roadblock, the only thing to do would be go smash crates and bash enemies until you have enough. On this playthrough, I actually never ran into this problem, thankfully. But this is because I was expecting it and prepared in advance. But like I said, I just don't want to buy a new weapon because I fear my bolt resources draining when I need those to get through the game. Side point, I also don't like the interface for buying ammo. I like the guy who runs the shop. Hi there, fuzzball. I got some great bargains for you today. But you have to buy every single bullet for every weapon, and that's just pointless. Let me buy however much I can afford instead of this tedium. Here's how I usually play this game. I get through the game by buying the essential weapons, leaving enough for progression, and once I unlock the hollow guys on Kalibo 3, I then go straight for the racetrack on Realgar and use it to glitch my way onto the racetrack without the hoverboard, and use the taunter weapon while standing under these infinitely respawning crates, and then three and a half hours later, I'll have over 200,000 bolts. This I can use to buy all the weapons left in the shop at this point in the game, like the Mind Glove or the Tesla Claw. There aren't any paywalls left at this point to worry about either, as I will then use my bolts to buy the premium nanotech which upgrades your maximum health. Then spending 150,000 bolts on the Rhino, the most powerful weapon in the galaxy sold to you by this dude in the street. What's a Rhino anyway? Rip ya a new one. What did you just say to me? R-Y-N-O. Rip ya a new one. Why, that's the most powerful missile launcher in the galaxy. I know it's worth a lot of bolts. He must have stolen it from the Blarg. Stolen? Look, trash can. Did I say anything about it being hot? You better watch your mouth or I'll... Wait, don't tell me. Rip you a new one. The Rhino tears everything apart, including bosses. And now I can use it on Core 2, Drex Fleet, and Velden. This is cheating to the extreme, because it would take like two or three playthroughs on New Game Plus in order to get the Rhino normally, but hey. Actually, there really isn't a but hey here, I'm just cheating in the game. The Hollow Guys glitch only exists on PS2 though. They patched it out on PS3, but you can still do this by glitching through a wall nearby with a decoy glove and then do the same thing. But back to the money issue. I do understand the fact that you need to spend it in-game in order to progress because it's part of the game's world building that everyone is a cynical douche that wants to get paid. But when translating that into this game's mechanics, I just think it becomes tedious. The final slap in the face coming from the new game plus mode where the gold bolts you've been finding can be used to upgrade your weapons into gold variants. But then you also have to spend thousands of bolts on that too. Thanks game. More grinding for me. Speaking of the culture in Ratchet and Clank, the cutscenes are indeed a joy to watch. Again, on PlayStation 2, the animators were able to pull off much more detail on the characters than they could on PS1, and it's still fun to watch these scenes to this day. The cutscenes are memorable because of how dry they are in comparison to the gameplay where it's all explosions and such. Most of the cutscenes, however, have no background music at all, it's just characters talking and it's really entertaining. The game is allowed to have Ratchet and Clank interact so much because of the fact that every planet has some non-plot relevant inhabitants for you to interact with that you either help for a reward or pay for a service. Many of these interactions are famous in the series, like the plumber. And blast it! <laughs> look, plumber's crack. What did you just say? I said, look, the plumber's back. All right, wise guy. When talking about the humor in Ratchet and Clank, I'm sure some in the audience might scoff at the idea of me talking about consumerism and capitalism satire because it's been talked about a lot in regards to this series but I think it's pretty much impossible to divorce the PS2 Ratchet and Clank games from satire. The series has the reputation of being comedy focused, but I just think in the first four games that it's almost always satirical. To get to every planet, you watch these info bots and half of them are parodies of propaganda and or TV commercials. 
Knowing established TV, celebrity, and cultural conventions is what allows things like this to be funny. Hello, citizens of... The escape transports are taking all the rich folks off this goddamn planet. So why aren't you on one? Socioeconomic disparity. What? He hasn't got enough bolts. Working people have to wait for Captain Quark to save us. How about I sell you these? At cost. Sell? After we just saved your scrawny butt? All right, all right. I'll give you the employee discount, too. Captain Quark here. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce this year's HoverCon Intergalactic Champions. Let's give it up for newcomers. Ratchet and Clank. Thank you for your cooperation. Cut! And if you don't like it, you can take your whiny, sniveling, snot-nosed populations, form a line behind me, and kiss my... We're still on? Well, turn it off, you idiot! Do I get a discount on gadgets now? Uh, you have to be with the company for two years before the employee discount kicks in. <laughs> I've got to get the heck out of here. I joined the army to get money to go to college. I never knew I'd end up in a war. Look at that last one. That's a direct joke about something that still exists today. The whole idea of Captain Quark is rooted in satire. The first time we hear him is in a commercial for Al's Robo Shack. Has this ever happened to you? Hi, I'm Captain Quark, and believe me, there's nothing worse than staring down a Blargy and Snaggle Beast from the inside and knowing your equipment isn't functioning properly. That's why I come to Al's Robo Shack for all my electronic needs. His thing is that he was once a real hero, but later became a washed up sellout relying on his name recognition to turn a profit by making cameos and selling cheap products. He is willing to sacrifice the lives of all the people who live on the planets that Drek is stealing resources from just to make money. When he fails to beat Ratchet and Clank, the deal with Drek is off, and in the very next stage, you find Quark trying to sell products with no shame. Thank you, and have a Quark-tastic day! What'd you say? Uh, nothing. I really do love the fact that this is his last scene in the game. He isn't even worth closure. He's pathetic. We have to stop the real villain who's a chairman of a company. I hope it's clear by now that my point is just that what gave Ratchet an identity as a comedy series was the jokes about the world we live in. Speaking of Drek though, he's a pretty good villain, being one of the few villains in the series where he himself is not a joke, even if he has funny moments. By the end game, Ratchet and Clank are both ready to take this guy on without distraction or argument, and it's the end game in particular that I find really engaging. Despite all the stuff I've said at Ratchet's detriment, whenever I play through this game again, I'm always impressed by how I never want to put the controller down. It's a really fun game, and having a story that I'm interested in and want to see the conclusion of helps with that, as finally taking down Quark on the Altanus base is satisfying. Seeing Ratchet and Clank put aside their differences is heartwarming, and the final stages get you pumped for the story's finish, as you first play on Altanus, and since the storm is so strong, Clank might get hit by lightning, so Ratchet plays this level completely by himself offering the most challenging platforming in the game. You explore Planet Quartu, the place where Clank was born at, and find that the computer glitch that created Clank was intentional, as the computer is self-aware enough to know that Drek's plan needs to be stopped. I will try to make you proud, Mom. You destroy Drek's fleet and then find that he's going to launch his new planet by destroying the one right next to it, Veldin, Ratchet's home, where the story began. Drek says it all right here. After all the trouble you've gone through, you're about to die right where you started. <laughs> it's, it's so poetic. This is it, Clank. Let's get him. Drek also reveals that his company actually was the one to pollute Orkson in the first place, and the reason he did that was so he could make a shit ton of bolts by being paid to help the Blarg species create a new world, where he'll gradually pollute that one as well and do the whole thing again. A despicable villain. The final boss being a pretty challenging multi-stage fight that will take effort to beat assuming you don't have the Rhino. Further establishing Drek as a memorable villain because he takes a long time to kill. This boss suffers from any issues I've brought up already, like the dodge mechanics, the camera, and the new gadget you might have, the PDA. The Gadgetron PDA. Public display of affection? No, 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 personal delivery assistant. A way to buy ammo on the fly sounds useful, but it will most likely drain your resources since ammo costs double on the PDA than it does normally. But even without the Rhino, you will beat this boss fight if you try hard enough, because of the fact that there is enough Devastator ammo lying around to do a decent amount of damage. But above all else, it's the connection between gameplay and story that allows me to remember this as an excellent moment and climax for a game. Like I said, I've got issues with Ratchet 1. Quite a lot. But to finally take down this evil douche and get rewarded with this ending where Clank's arm is broken and he thinks Ratchet's leaving him behind... Ah, you'll be alright. And you get these lines... Hey, Tin Can! Ha! <laughs>
<laughs> Where do you think you're going? We, uh, still need to fix that arm. That's a moment. It's something I won't forget anytime soon, which is basically how I feel about Ratchet & Clank 1. It's a game I remember very fondly because it's a memorable experience. I can be irked by its flaws like difficulty balancing or the controls because of the fact that I like playing this game and I know it has the potential to be even better with a sequel. And I think that was the attitude surrounding this game when it came out. They already started working on ideas for a sequel before the first game was even released. Ratchet & Clank is a concept with a lot of appeal in and of itself, with an interesting pair of lead characters that have had their origins and universe thoroughly explored in this first entry, and with all that set up already, a sequel could only expand upon it further. I used to be really harsh on this game many years ago because of its frustrating aspects, but today, I can just appreciate it for what it is, which I also think is helped a lot by the 2016 reboot game. I wanted to avoid talking about this as much as possible because I think this game plays a large part in the paradigm shift that has taken place in regards to Ratchet 1. Its lack of strafing, or Ratchet being a jerk to Clank, are all things that this game was remembered for. And then by the time you reach Tools of Destruction on PS3 in 2007, things kind of changed, but they were similar enough to the PS2 games to be fine. But by the time you reach 2016, Ratchet is so different from where it started that it's hard not to go back to that first game and see how much it got right from its next-gen appeal and art design, its amazing soundtrack, its satirical humor, and its really fun core gameplay loop. Especially when 2016 is supposed to be an adaptation of that original work. But in execution, it vacuumed all the life out of the original with the suck cannon. I said I didn't really want to make that many parallels to the 2016 game in this video because I just wanted this to be about my thoughts on the original Ratchet and Clank without 2016 comparisons, and I think it did a good job covering that. I think the game works really well but has many kinks to iron out, which we'll talk about in the next video that will cover Ratchet and Clank 2. Like I said, it's going to drop next week, but if you pay as low as a dollar, you can check it out right now. But I think that's enough for one video. Thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see you next time. Do you have a problem with unwanted hair? Is painful itching in your nether regions causing you undue embarrassment? Do you just plain stink? Then you need this! The Gadgetron Personal Hygienator! Hi, I'm Steve... McQuark. And this little baby can take care of any grooming needs that are just too much trouble for you to handle yourself. Allow me to demonstrate. Ah, ah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mommy. Turn it off! Turn it off!